Thanks for tuning in to another episode of Brutes, where we tell the stories behind your favorite beer. This is Sound Guy Ryan, and joining me, as always, is Erica and Matt. What's up, everybody? Hey. Man, I am still recovering from my weekend of day drinking. Oh, yeah, you did some serious day drinking. I did. I tried to capture every single one, <laughs> and uh, I failed. I failed miserably. Oh, but well, uh, well, at least you tried. I tried. <laughs> uh, but before we get into what I drank, I know that you guys drank a lot less than me, so <laughs> what did you both drink? Ryan, why did you go first? Um, well, uh, the, the usual true North <laughs> Sylvaticus. Um, why, why do we even ask him anymore? Night shift. <laughs> I had some night shift. Um, what else? Some of that, um, Cigar City, which is our guest this week. Yeah. Ooh. Um, and yeah, that's basically it. It was good. Everything was good. I didn't have a lot of time to drink this weekend. So every, every beer was special. Ooh. Aww, that's cute. Erica, what'd you drink? Um, you know, just crazy stuff. Um, I actually had Night Shift's Golden Delicious Cider, which was solid. Oh, the cider. Yeah, yeah. I haven't had their cider yet. And um, I was at their uh, their Owl's Nest on Esplanade, which was very nice. I highly recommend you check that out. Um, and I had one, and it was perfect for the beautiful weather. Nice. Yeah, yeah. I was going to go to the Esplanade on Friday evening, Ooh. but I ran out of time. Yeah, that happens. Yeah, so... Um, <laughs> On Friday, instead, I decided to start my day drinking. Good, nice. Which Good. was night Good. drinking. Yeah. Yeah. So uh, <laughs> Friday night, I, I was, you know, I was in a mood where I was like, hard seltzers, give them to me. So mm. I drank some Topo Chico. Ooh, your fave. I've been adding vodka to them. So <laughs> Just to boost them up more? They're extra hard. <laughs> um, yeah, th- that was fun. That, um, is, that sounds fun. And then I woke yeah. up, made breakfast, and I went for like a jog and like worked Good out. Good for you. Good yeah, for you. Yeah. Did some yoga and- uh, Back to day drinking? And then I went to day drinking <laughs> again. Yeah. We, uh, the lady and I, we went to Salem. We went to Knox. We went right when they yeah, opened. Yeah. It was that perfect. That looked fun. That looked it really was, nice. It was a lot of, you know, there was a lot of people there, but we we're still kind of socially distanced. Yeah. And, um, I feel like you were send, uh, trend setters as well. Like after you went, I feel like I saw like- a bunch of other people on yes. Instagram posting yeah, the being there. Yeah, beer narrator, yeah. Uh, Sherms, all those people we saw. Yeah. I, you know, it's funny. Uh, the beer narrator and I were like uh, passing ships. Like we Ooh, were there within the like 10 minutes of each other, which was kind of a bummer. Yeah. But yeah. Uh, I had to go on and do more day drinking. Right. Yeah. So I uh, went home. I had um, Spigot River. Uh, nice. Their Mia, yeah, which was awesome, stuff. and and we went to Spigot River last week after recording. Yeah, that was fun. That was a lot of fun. Yeah, uh, if you haven't been out to Lawrence for Spigot River, I highly suggest going out there. Outdoor, um, they have a great outdoor little area yeah. there for drinking, and just in general, I mean, outdoor drinking is a thing now for beer patios and everything else. Yeah, so. and I just want to do that interview so bad with them because <laughs> I I <laughs> we talked with the the team over there at Spigot River just for a little while. Yeah, and like. Their story sounds crazy. Yeah. Like they're like such characters and we just can't wait to like sit down with them. Yeah. I want to get so wavy cool. for that. Yeah. <laughs> no, no, it's gonna be fun. Um I drank that and then I had an amazing cider from um and I'm and I'm drawing a blank oh, on it. Uh, Carlson's Car- Carlson's? Carlson. Yeah, Carlson Cider. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um and I love gala apples. Yeah. This is a gala apple cider that nice. literally tasted like juice. D Lish. Yeah. But um, other than that, it was fun to go out to a brewery. It's been a while since I've gone out to a brewery. It really has. Like, on yeah. that time we went out last week was, like, I think the first time in forever. Yeah. It felt so good. So What's up with that? Come on. No, I know. But uh, it just made me really excited to go to- No, it was to... just the first time I think I've been out with people. Like, yeah. Just to go have a beer at a brewery. Yeah. And it wasn't, like, a big deal in the world. And it, felt, it was cool. It was. It felt nice. It felt nice. Yeah. yeah. So I know Ryan, you've been doing that all along, and whatever, awesome. I'm Ryan. glad that you've been able to do that. <laughs> um, but I'm excited to go to Western Mass and check out Four Star Farms Brewery. Oh, yes. Um, because specifically they have that bike path, mm-hmm. right? Um, so you can bike to it. And Ryan, are we going to bike to it? Uh, no, I have a vehicle. Oh well, we're uh, gonna bike. Well, yeah, I'm or, gonna roller skate. skate. I'll, I'll, yeah. I'll race yeah, you. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah, you can do that, Ryan. You can have three or four beers before there. <laughs> oh, at least. <laughs> but uh, yeah, that is probably the brewery I'm most excited to travel to. Second yeah. being uh, Castle Island's new location. Ooh, yeah. Um, and then, you know, I I, I want to go up to Portland again. I'm going to be in Philly this weekend. You have to. Uh, so I am gonna stop at some breweries that I'm pretty excited for. Um, I'm gonna be there on Saturday, Sunday, and Monday. So if you guys are listening and you hear. Or you know of any breweries that we, 
uh, me, we, me, <laughs> uh, need to uh, go to in Philly, uh, let us know because I have a list of some that I need to go to. Yeah. I'm very excited yeah. for. Matt needs some uh, some ideas of yeah. things to do. I'm also looking for the best brunch place too. <sighs> yes, I love brunch. Well, I'm going to go eat some food and listen to this episode. Yeah, I, I'm, I'm down. I can eat some food. Ryan, you want to eat some food and listen to the episode? Some food? Yes. Yes. So <laughs> right answer. <laughs> you hit that uh, magical button in the studio, Ryan, to make it go do 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 and play. And uh, we'll catch you on the outro. Cheers. Cheers. Eric and Sound Guy Ryan, we are here today talking to a brewery that I think a lot of our listeners have heard about. Uh, yeah. Because I specifically, I do love their High Lie Ale um, beer. Um, and, and we can get a a good amount of different variety of the beers that they have um, available to us in Massachusetts. So I'm very, very thankful for that because uh, last summer, this was my go-to beer. Uh, yeah. I was crushing this at the beach. I was crushing this at home. Um, it was a pandemic beer for me. Nice. Uh, uh, I mean, local beers, of course. Yeah. We are yeah, local yeah, to Massachusetts. Well. Well. Um, but I, I do have to say that this one was one of the more consistent beers that I had. And I always had, you know. Nice. 12 pack in the uh in the good old fridge <laughs> um i'd be shocked if our listeners do not know uh who this brewery is erica who do we have on we have cigar city that's right yeah um and i remember my friend eric i i, I mentioned this to neil moving down to florida and saying like i'm scared to move down to florida we have amazing beer down uh, up in massachusetts i haven't heard much about the beer scene in florida and i heard their chinese food is terrible so what happened? I can speak to he's found a good beer scene. Okay, I can't cool. speak to the Chinese food, <laughs> uh, and I won't speak to the Chinese food. Okay. Ne- Neil and Wayne, you can speak to that if you if you choose to. But uh, thanks for doing the podcast. <laughs> Absolutely, Re- really, really excited to be here with you guys. Yeah, awesome. it's our pleasure. Yeah. Uh, so we start every podcast by asking our guests uh, their role at the brewery and their first memory of beer. My name is Wayne Wombles. I am the brewmaster for Cigar City Brewing. And um, I was the, the very first employee of the company. I helped to, to, to design all the original beers and a lot of the, the beers uh, we produce today. Um, and uh, just been, you know, 13 years of uh, trying to make the best beer we can and, um, and uh, continue to share the culture of, of the area that the brewery is located in, which is uh, Central Florida. First memory of beer? Oh, man. Um, Very first memory, probably about five or six years old. I think my dad was drinking canned Miller or something like that. Nice. And thought it would be really funny to see what a five-year-old thought of it. Um, (laughs) It was terrible. It was terrible. (laughs) It was really awful. Yeah. Yeah. Fun. Fun. Neil, what about yourself? Uh, I'm Neil Callahan. I'm the brand manager with Cigar City Brewing. I've been with the company since 2014, worn a lot of hats, um, but uh, a lot of what I do as brand manager is help kind of hone the messaging. So I do a lot of the copywriting. I do a lot of the, all the stuff that you see on the side of the cans I write. I do a lot of traveling as well, you know, sort of pre-COVID times, but um, getting out and just sort of telling the story about Cigar City Brewing and um, what we're doing down in Tampa and, and, why people should be excited about it. Yep. Um, so it's it's pretty cool. I get to travel around and drink beer. Could be a lot worse. Um, <laughs> Could be, certainly. And, and then first memory of beer, that's that's a good question as well. I, that, that, that's a really good one. I hadn't really thought of it. <laughs> I, don't, I don't think Wayne had thought of it either, right? No, but I, I had to go back because there's a difference between first memory and when you got into beer or right. first beer that inspired you. Facts. They're completely different things. Yeah, I, I, mine's probably pretty similar to yours then, Wayne. I remember a uh, um, uh, certain relative who shall remain nameless giving me a, a sip of beer when I was, you know, nine or ten and thinking it was absolutely vile. Yeah. yeah. Uh, so I'm, I am curious, uh, how did you two get into the craft beer world in 2013, 2014? Uh, Wayne, have you been doing this before when you uh, entered Cigar City? And Neil, what, what about yourself? Um, I started brewing, home brewing in 1993. Nice. And um, I grew up in Southeast Alabama, so homebrewing was illegal in Southeast Alabama, and right. uh, <laughs> and there weren't there weren't a lot of uh, wait in 1993 homebrewing was still illegal. Oh, definitely. Yeah, Holy definitely. shit! When did it become legal? Do you know? 
Uh, I'd be embarrassed to tell you, honestly. Yeah. Okay. Because okay. I, I don't think it was legalized <laughs> until like uh, 2011 or 12 wow. or something like that. Holy cow. That's crazy. And the only state I think that was legalized about the same time was Mississippi. And I think those might have been the last two states in, in the union that uh, that weren't uh, didn't have legalized home brewing. Wow. wow. Um, even, obviously, it was legal on a federal level, but right. it wasn't legal on a state level. Um, Fun. So it, it was complicated. Obviously, you know, there was no place to buy homebrew materials. So I, was, I started ordering out of uh, Narragansett. I was actually getting it from the Northeast and yeah. having it shipped down. I'm not completely sure why I did that. Um, it was just maybe it was one of the first articles that I ran across in like a homebrewing magazine or something. Um, but, uh, you know, also one of the driving forces behind me starting to homebrew was the fact that there there just really wasn't much of anything you, you could get in my hometown. Um, I remember Pete's Wicked Ale being uh, very available. I, mean, I could get it in most gas stations in this small town in, in Alabama that I used to live in. Um, Boston, uh, Boston Lager, Boston Ale, you know, Boston Beer Company beers, mm-hmm. those are fairly mm-hmm. easy to find. But in imports like bass, but it was really hard to find um, a craft beer. Um, and I, you know, started getting interested in reading and um, started reading things, uh, some of Michael Jackson's books, which, you know, he, he was a great writer because he actually talked about um, different styles and how different styles, uh, you know, tasted and what kind of uh, profiles different styles should exhibit. Um, and these are styles that I couldn't get. So I started um, started ordering beer from uh from a place up in Oregon, um, it's horse brass. It was connected to horse brass. It was out of Portland. Um, and God, I can't remember the name Belmont station. And they had a bunch of different beers. So it was ordering those beers, having them shipped down and drinking them to understand different classic styles. At the yeah. same time I was brewing, um, you know, beer at home. And, um, like for instance, some, some of the, some of the things that I learned, actually I learned, from brewing the beer before I actually ever tasted a classic example. Hefeweizen was one of those beers. I brewed a Hefeweizen, it was finished, you know, opened the bottle, poured it into a glass, smelled it, and I was like, I've just ruined this beer. <laughs> and a friend of mine, he had family in Germany and had, he had visited over there and he goes, no, this is actually perfect. This is exactly what it should be. But I'd never tasted a beer that, that was just so bombarded and exhibited so much uh, banana character. Yeah, I was yeah. going to say, you, the yeah. banana must have thrown you off quite a bit, yeah. Big time. And then the phenols, you know, the clove yep. elements oh, yeah, yeah. that that yep. style has. Um, but It's funny, we uh, recently uh, talked with somebody about brewing Hefeweizen and said it's an easy style to brew, but it's a hard style to perfect. So kudos to you for perfecting it early on. It's. I, I wouldn't say I perfected it. You know, I, <laughs> yeah. got, I got in the range. Right, yeah. right. Um, but, you know, as far as Hefeweizen's go... I think the most important thing about Hefeweizen is fermentation temperature and the right yeast. For sure. Um, it's one of the most temperature sensitive yeast that, that I've ever used. But um, there was a, a like a brew pub about 30 miles away from my hometown. And uh, I would bother them all the time trying to get a job there. And eventually, after several years, they, they gave me a job. <laughs> and I worked there for um, for. Uh, a few years before I will actually probably only like a year and a half. And then I was given a job to work at a brewery in, uh, in Tallahassee, Florida, which um, had much better equipment, was uh, much better put together, much, uh, it was managed much better. It was just all, it was like a working at a real commercial <laughs> brewing job. Yeah. Um, and then this company, they're called Buckhead Brewery and Grill. They were no longer in existence. They started opening um, brew pubs around the perimeter of Atlanta. So I moved up there to work at those branches. Um, eventually, uh, they got to the point to where it, it was shortly after 9-11. Um, I think it really had a pretty big impact on the restaurant business. And as a result of that, and as a result of them building these very expensive, you know, like, you know, probably multi-million dollar facilities that had high ceilings and open glass and it was like the colorado hunting lodge it was a log cabin yeah um 
they were massively expanding and um, eventually got to the point where I think that uh, things became very challenged. And, um, and uh, you know, one day the employees went in and there were locks on the doors. So ah. yeah, oh. it was, it was taken back. And yeah. after that, I moved back to Alabama. I worked for a brew pub that was in Dothan, which was the same city uh, that I got my first brew pub job, you know, 30 miles away from my hometown. Um, and then I took a job at Foothills Brewing Company in Winston-Salem and then um, Cigar City. And I've been there for over 13 years now. Wow. Awesome. That's awesome. awesome. Thank you for sharing all of that. That's yeah. certainly a really cool story. Uh, it's so funny to hear you kind of shipping beer before shipping beer was kind of like a cool thing to I do. I was going to say that seems such like a long time ago to be shipping beer. Yeah. But that's cool. Yeah. Uh, Neil, good luck uh, topping that story. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I tried my, to keep it as concise as possible. Too, <laughs> so. I've, I've heard that story a couple of times and trust me, you got the short version. Okay. Oh, good. Yeah. <laughs> but um, yeah, my, mine's pretty straightforward. Um, I came in through the retail end. I was bartending at a few places and places. This is, you know, 2007, 2008 um, out in New York. And at that point there were a few breweries, but um, it was craft wasn't sort of front and center at, at a lot of those places. But um, through some friends, I had a friend that was doing all the beer buying at the Whole Foods on the Bowery in Manhattan. And that was at that point, I know it, it kind of seems wild, but that was really the place to go to get good craft beer. There weren't a whole lot of places, especially in Manhattan, to get really good craft beer. So one of my best friends in the world was the beer buyer there, and he started exposing me to new styles and that sort of thing. Moved uh, to Georgia, actually. So Wayne and I kind of have a, a few cross connections in Georgia um, and got a job at a really great craft beer bar called Trapeze Pub that was in Athens, Georgia. Um, learned a ton about beer from a guy named Eric Johnson, who now runs a place called uh, Wild Heaven Craft Beer. And we've done a couple collabs with them. They're, they're in the Atlanta area. Um, moved to Atlanta and then long story short in 2014, the opportunity presented itself to come and, uh, manage the tap room at Cigar City Brewing. So took that. And then within about a year or two, um, Joey, Joey Redner, who's our founder at Cigar City Brewing kind of said, Hey, I, I think there's opportunity for you to kind of get out in the world and tell the story about what Cigar City is all about and get people excited about it. So I've been on the road drinking beer since then. Yeah. I think <laughs> awesome. a lot of the times that is awesome. Yeah. I think a lot of the times our listeners go, I found your beer, for example, at Whole Foods for the first time, you know, many years ago. Um, we grab beer and we say, you know, this is a cool looking can. This sounds cool. I saw it on Untapped. I saw it on Instagram, but they don't know the story. So what is the story of Cigar City? The, the kind of quick and dirty version is the company was founded in 2007 by Joey Redner. Um, and his idea really was to tell the story of Tampa, Florida, like Wayne had said earlier, um, to talk about the culture, cuisine and history of this area. Um, at the time, when we talk about Tampa Bay, we're talking about a metro area of about 3.2 million people. So that's Tampa, St. Petersburg, Sarasota, kind of out to Lakeland. Um, at that point, this is 2007 there were only six craft breweries in a metro area of 3.2 million people. Um, wow. You know, even a place like Massachusetts or the Northeast had way more breweries than that. And certainly if you look <laughs> yeah. at a place like Colorado yeah. or Southern California, um, we were really way under index. So he saw kind of a wide open playing field and um, got together with Wayne. And I think Wayne can kind of pick up the story from there in some of the earlier days. But those two guys really made a, a pretty in, large impact on what Florida craft beer would become. Yeah, talk about Florida craft beer. Many times uh, in the beginning, he would um, Joey would often say, "I didn't want to open a brewery." Um, <laughs> and seriously, we've heard that story uh, too. Yeah, <laughs> he said, "I didn't want to open a brewery, but no one else was doing it." And you know, he didn't feel like what we had at the time was you know uh, suitable enough for you know what he thought the area needed. So he he ended up opening a brewery. Um, and first time I met him in person was when I was working at Foothills and it was during one of the sexual chocolate chocolate releases. Um, and, uh, I had a mutual, uh, or I had a friend in the industry who had interviewed for the, the position, uh, and decided not to take the position. So this person ended up calling me and, and, 
knows me very well because I'd, I'd worked with this person in Atlanta and basically said, you know, after interviewing with him, I, I think you guys would be the perfect match because what he wants to do is very similar to, to what you just naturally do. Um, at, at that point, I'd only been in Winston-Salem for maybe like, I don't know, like 11 or 12 months or something. And I just, you know, like I, I hate moving. I really hate moving. I, <laughs> yeah. I'm sure everybody yes. does. Um, but that was the only thing that sort of made me pause. Um, and I, I waited several days before I emailed him and, and applied for the position. But um, uh, things just went well. And, you know, by my first day on the job, I, I reached out in late 2007. And my first day on the job was in March of 2008. So everything happened pretty quickly. Um, and, uh, you know, from that point on, it was like a matter of me trying to understand what, what is the local culture of, of Tampa? You know, like, so it was, it was like going to, to restaurants and, um, you know, like museums and different things in the area and trying to get more versed and, and have more understanding about what does it mean to make beer that represents this brewery that's trying to tell the story of Tampa. And um, it was uh, it was educational, tasty, um, and uh, a lot of fun. So, um, and then that sort of leads us up into you know like the majority of 2008, which was spent you know discussing um, uh, the goals of the brewery and uh, the original core brands of the brewery and brewing multiple pilot batches, uh, deciding which things would work because even on a homebrew scale, we were able to to really dial in some processes, even though they, they weren't automated exactly like they would be once we had the, the, the equipment in place and we're up and running. Right. Um, but that's kind of what, what leads us up to the opening, um, uh, the brewery in March of 2009. Yeah. And we actually would have had, had the brewery open probably by January of, of 2009, but we ran into some problems uh, with city permitting and ah. uh, imagine that, you know, like right. yeah, we've heard that story, we've like heard that. <laughs> that, that story is almost um, a, as long as time. <laughs> you know. But the permitting cost us, uh, you know, almost three months. Ugh. So we ended up opening yeah. up and uh, like early, early to the first half of March of 2008. Yeah. And we, and we've, uh, you know, rolled with the punches and um, made some pretty cool beers, made a lot of great friends and, uh, uh, it's been it's been pretty awesome. You yeah. Know? All right. So before we get into the meat what, and potatoes, if you will, yeah, I guess the meat and <laughs> potatoes. Yeah, uh, we have a word from our amazing sponsors. So, sound guy Ryan, take it away. Take it away. Did you know that your favorite Massachusetts breweries use hops from a local family-owned hop farm right here in Massachusetts? Our friends over at Four Star Farms are there for you, whether you're a commercial brewery or a small batch home brewer. Make sure to head over to their website today and get your hands on some of the best and freshest hops available locally. Cheers. Cheers. At our local homebrew shop, Beer and Wine Hobby, you can get everything you need to make beer, wine, cider, cheese, and more. Not sure where to start? They have knowledgeable staff there to help. Beer and Wine Hobby is family owned and located in Danvers, Massachusetts. Visit their website, beer-wine.com, and use our promo code BRUITS for 10% off your online order today. Shirks on Tap is the box subscription service where you can get some of the dopest brewery t-shirts out there. I'm talking breweries from Dallas, San Diego, and even our home area of New England. And you might ask, how do I get my hands on some? To get your first box for $5, click the link below in our description, or head on over to our website, breweries.com. Remember, drink better beer, wear better shirts. Cool. So... As someone who's only been to Florida to go to Disney World on a school trip. Yes. <laughs> I know. I'm sorry. I don't know much about the Florida scene other than like, unfortunately, like Florida man or something like that, you know, and I don't want to get into that. What is the Tampa? Oh, and I guess Tom Brady went in the Super Bowl, mm, which kind of sucks for us, yeah. but whatever. Like, 
Uh, good for him. Seven rings. It's cool. Uh, what's the the Tampa Bay area like? What's the culture like? And what did you want to incorporate into the brewery? It, Tampa Bay, it's really unique even within Florida. Florida is such a big, wacky state. And yeah, Florida man's real, to your point. <laughs> He's real. He's out there. Um, but really, the, the culture around Tampa is completely different than the culture in Miami. And that's completely different than the culture in Tallahassee. So it really has its own idiosyncrasies. But um, really, the history of Tampa, you can't talk about Tampa without talking about tobacco and cigar history. Late 1800s, early 1900s, the industry that really... Uh, helped Tampa grow at an amazing clip was the cigar industry. Um, a guy named Ebor um, came down and brought cigar manufacturing to Tampa. And with it came uh, eventually tens of thousands of people that were involved in hand rolling cigars and in, uh, mostly in an area called Ebor City now. So before wow. the Cuban Revolution, Tampa was the biggest purchaser of Cuban made tobacco in the world. And again, wow. there were thousands and thousands of people hand rolling cigars. So uh, Ybor City, City is still a thing um, with the Cuban Revolution and the embargo and all that. The cigar industry really sort of um, disappeared pretty quickly. But it, it ha is having a kind of smaller revival. But all that to say, um, Ybor City, the not only did you have this um, Latin influence, a ton of Cuban folks, um, Puerto Rican influence, some Mexican influence as well. But there were a lot of German immigrants, a lot of Italian immigrants as well. All of that really helped inform the culture of Tampa. So it's got this incredible Latin influence, um, but it also has these little idiosyncrasies that you don't find in, say, Miami or other parts of Florida. Um, Ybor City and, and Tampa especially, you know, Florida is not a very old place. There's, it's not like, you know, a, a Boston or in New York where you walk around and you get a sense of the history of the mm -hmm. place. Uh, Tampa and Ybor City especially is one of the few places around, in my mind, in Florida, where you really get a sense of the history of the place and how these different elements and different immigrant groups came in and informed what Tampa is all about, um, which is pretty cool. And uh, yeah, it's it's unlike any other place in, in the country, but even within Florida, Tampa is a really unique place. Um, I think Wayne, you know, it, I think touched on a really important point that when Joey, who is a Tampa native, he's a fifth generation Floridian. He's oh, lived his wow. whole life, Jeez. whole life in Tampa. Florida man um, without being Florida man. <laughs> exactly. Yeah, yeah. Exactly. Um, I think it's actually really telling that when Joey wanted to show Wayne, look, this is what I'm trying to, this is the culture I'm trying to express through beer. He brought him to restaurants. Yeah. Um, Cub Cuban restaurants, Italian restaurants. It's really, I think, um, telling that the, the, the food culture and the cuisine of Tampa is really critical to what the area is all about. And I think Wayne could probably speak on some of that a little bit. Yeah, I mean, but it was also, you know, bodegas and Latin markets and different things like that, too, which mm -hmm. was kind of cool. I mean, you go this little you would go to this little bodega or like Latin market and you could find some amazingly good Cuban sandwiches there. There were also some, you know, like Aguas Frescas. It wasn't unusual to see Aguas Frescas at these places. And where there's Aguas Frescas, there's usually paletas. And basically what they're doing to make paletas is they're taking leftover Aguas Frescas and pulling, pouring them into popsicle molds and making popsicles that are then called paletas. So awesome. Um, yeah, it's it was uh, you know learned a whole lot, but it's you know it was also the naming and everything like that was really tied into the culture. And I still remember um, you know like driving home from one of these uh, these lunches um, and talking about what are we going to name this IPA? And um, and Joey throws out Highlight. Yeah, you know, I was going to ask you, yeah, Highlight. <laughs> Van. Yeah. We're, we're riding in his minivan. He was like, why don't we call it Highlight IPA? I mean, that that totally works. I mean, it's like a fast-paced game. And, um, you know, like, if you think about the speed of the ball and the impact of the hops in an IPA, that would be kind of cool. And I was like, yeah, sounds great. So, <laughs> Highlight's terrifying. I mean, I saw someone literally break their leg playing Highlight. It's, it's, yeah. no, it's, no, it's joke. no joke. Yeah. <laughs> so what, what I always say, and again, having traveled and Wayne's, I'm sure the same way, having traveled around the world, telling people about High Lai, if you're from Florida, you know what High Lai is. If you're from certain parts of the Northeast, you might know what it is, but a lot of people don't. Yeah. So kind of the, the, it's a sport and the cultural references that I use to kind of show what it is. If you're over the age of 40, it's the thing in the beginning of Miami Vice. Yeah. <laughs> 
<laughs> if you're under the age of 40, there was an episode of Jackass where they were throwing oranges at Steve-O's ass on, on a, a highlight arena. <laughs> yeah. So, you know, right. we're, we're bridging cultural gaps here. Yeah, I, um, I recently explained highlight yes. as like uh, lacrosse on steroids, but you get hit with a ball. Yeah, it's sort of like racquetball with a big yeah. wicker scoop called a cesta at the end of your arm, but that ball can go 120 miles oh, an hour. Yeah. So Jeez. it's like I saw some guy literally shatter their leg. I was like, this is the grossest thing I've ever seen. <laughs> so, it, you know, cool. finding that cultural reference <laughs> is tough, but also getting people to pronounce the beer correctly is tough. Um, yeah, what's the worst heard, pronunciation you've heard? We've heard them all. JLA, Jialai, um, Jolly Ali. My, that one's my favorite. Yeah, I don't. I don't know how you look at that and get Dolly Dolly, but you must have been um, pumped when I was like, "Hi, I just whipped that off." No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> I, would, I mean, we always say, as as long as you're drinking, we don't care how you pronounce it. Yeah, nice. <laughs> Is it safe to say that's the flagship for Cigar City? Definitely, there's no question about that at all. Cool, none whatsoever. Yeah. Um, was that an early recipe for you? Was that one of like the the OG? Like you started the brewery and was like. We have we have lightning in a bottle. Like. So the, the two original core brands were Maduro and Highlight. And um, the crazy thing about this is Highlight was actually brewed as a pilot back in 2008. And um, I was I was disappointed with it. Uh, I I knew that we needed to make some changes to get it to where, you know, I, I, where I envisioned it being and drinking. Um, so. Uh, the crazy thing about Maduro is it was actually never piloted. It oh. was the first time it was brewed, it was straight Production. into a 15 barrel yeah. batch of it. Wow. And, um, and it turned out to be a good beer, but nice. uh, there were some complications, not because of the way that we brewed it, but they turned our power off for three months. Oh. And, um, uh, but we lost the yeast, but we were able to save the beer. Um, so Highlight only had one pilot uh, like on like a six gallon scale. But I was quickly able to to see what needed to be changed, and we changed mm. that the next time we brewed it, which was on a 15 barrel yeah. scale. And then it continued to sort of evolve um, throughout 2009, and probably into like halfway through 10, um, just small tweaks here and there. Mm. And uh, you know, I can I continue to try to keep it modern is the best way I can put it. Yeah. Um, and then just really small tweaks to try to keep, you know, they're, they're, you know, like new processes, um, uh, you know, like new, uh, raw materials, different things that can be used. Uh, the idea is not to drastically change the beer. It's, uh, to make it more stable in some situations, um, to brighten up some elements of it a little bit. Um, yeah. Uh, it's it's nothing about vastly changing the beer. The majority of the big changes I think happened in between 2009 and 2000, yeah. middle of 2010. Is that a beer? I mean, I'm sure there's rock stars, musicians out there who hate playing their world famous song and they have to play it every night. Is that a beer <laughs> that you hate brewing at this point? I'm sure there's a lot of people that hate brewing it maybe <laughs> because of how the frequency of it. Um, but it, it's, you know, it's definitely... It's it's a challenging beer to brew. I mean, it's got a lot of components. Mm. Um, I have, from a process standpoint, I don't think it's the most challenging beer. I mean, it's an IPA. Yeah. Um, but uh, the results of it, I'm still you know very proud of. When I when I look back at it and think about um, the type of hybrid beer that it was um, in, in 2009, and still the way that it's maintained its identity and and uh, and the fact that so many people enjoy it today, um, that's, uh, and that, I mean, I can't tell you how good that makes me feel, you know, yeah. that have something have that kind of longevity. Um, uh, I mean, we're talking about now we're talking about, um, what 12 years now we're it's talking about time for one beer style. It's pretty yeah. good. Yeah, 12 years old and it's yeah. still remain you know relevant in the market yeah and gr and actually increasing in in market share nice so i, I mean it, that's not easy to do and it, it's definitely not easy to do um i think in the last you know like probably eight years, years right? or so yeah. Yeah. yeah i was i was gonna actually mention that uh in a world of hazy ipas your new england style ipas um how is the market share growing for a relatively clear beer very crisp and easy drinking beer. 
Yeah, it's not super yeah, hazy. I, mean, <laughs> I definitely can't complain about it. I'm I'm super happy with with how it's done over the years. And uh, but like I said, I, I think part of it has to do with the fact that I continue to try to keep it modern um, and try not to let it slip away. Mm. Definitely. For, for I mean, for all of the to, sort of to your point, for all of the batches of highlight that have been brewed since 2009, um, Wayne and I both sit on our sensory panel and we'll be in sensory and have a sample of, you know, a certain batch of highlight and the whole, everybody on the panel will go, holy shit, that's a really good beer. It, it still surprises awesome. us sometimes how exceptional yeah. uh, some of these batches can be. I mean, they're, they're all fantastic, but every now and then we get a batch of highlight and it's just it not, knocks it out of the park. Um, but I just to kind of touch on that sort of hazy New England tie-in, um, I think that's part of what, especially in the early days, kind of set highlight apart. This is 2009, so you, you know, I assume you guys were drinking beer back then. This is when, when you talked about IPAs, the words piney, resinous, right. bitter, resin, bitter. Yeah. This, oh, yeah. this is West when Coast. green, yeah, green flash green palette flash, record yeah. was mm-hmm. a thing. It was like it had to hurt your teeth. To yeah, drink. how many IBUs <laughs> can you put into a beer? Exactly. Yeah. Right. It's the the great IBU wars of the the late the late aughts. Um, <laughs> and highlight came out, and it was none of those things. It was balanced. It was fruit forward. The bitterness was there really to complement, and it was really it took a back seat to the hop flavor and hop aroma. And IPAs really weren't doing that. Yeah. Um, so it's certainly like you said, it's not a hazy IPA. It's not a, a juicy IPA. But I think you know it kind of. Uh, pumping Wayne's ego a little bit, but it, I, I really think that that beer helped inform a lot of the direction that IPAs have gone where, you know, as we're drinking them today. Yeah, I couldn't Definitely. agree more. Before we get into more of the other beer styles that you are brewing, because you're not only just brewing high, I believe it or not, <laughs> there are other beers that Cigar City is putting out there. We have a word from our sponsors. So, Ryan, Take click that button and put up the sponsors. Are you a solo artist, band, podcaster, or anyone else who needs recording services? Well, we got a place for you where your vision can become a reality. Welcome to Small Pond Studios, built by hand with heart and sweat equity by musicians for musicians. Go to smallpondstudios.io to reach out to get more information. And make sure you let them know that Brute sent you. Hey, Sound Guy Ryan here. Didn't know if you heard, but we're a part of the Hopped Up Network. There you'll find other informative podcasts about beer. So go ahead, follow them on social media, and visit them on their website, hoppedupnetwork.com, to learn more about the people, beer, and breweries from around the country. And until next time, thanks for listening. Cheers. Welcome back. Welcome back. Welcome back. Welcome back. That, that was too many welcome backs. No, that's like the song. Oh, it's, it's a song? Yeah. Oh. Welcome back, Carter. Oh, I, I don't know. Showing things. my age or maybe just showing how much Nick at Night I watch. Yeah, probably. <laughs> All right. So we're here cool. with Cigar City. Yeah. If you're, still, still here with yeah, Cigar City. If you're like skipping back into the episode. That's cool. Yeah. Um, yeah. So quick question for me anyways. Um, people have already asked like... Brewing in a warmer climate, you know, are there more technical difficulties, technical things you have to deal with with that? Um, how does that affect your brewing process? Can you log a? <laughs> yeah, um, I mean, there's uh, obviously a lot of black mold um, that, uh, yep. that can accumulate and you have to beat all that stuff back. Um, it's more challenging on uh, glycol chillers, which are the, the machines that cool down the the, the liquid that cools down the, the beer in the tanks. Um, and, uh, you know, there a lot of them are designed to work in moderate conditions, not in Tampa, Florida weather conditions. Right. So a lot of times if you're going to start a brewery in Tampa, you want to uh, go over the, the uh, recommended BTU, cooling BTU that they tell you and, uh, probably increase that by around 33 percent um yeah those are some of like the typical challenges and that's just based upon the weather conditions yeah um and you know obviously the high humidity also promotes promotes black mold um so um i mean 
I mean, those are, I think, th- I think those are the biggest challenges. Yeah. Just, just weather based. Yeah. Mm. So Cigar City, obviously known for High Light Ale. What is the, the other beers that you're brewing? You're not also, you're brewing a, a plethora of other ones. I've heard something about a uh, mo- margarita. Yeah, that's right. Yeah. Yeah. You want to talk about some other brands, Neil, and I can maybe touch on some of the ones we've done more recently that I've been kind of proud of, but didn't really leave the brewery. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Um, You know, up in New England, especially, you're going to see Maduro Brown Ale, which, like Wayne said, Mm -hmm. was the very first beer we ever brewed. My favorite beer that we do year round, Um, full bodied, chocolatey Northern English Brown Ale. Um, Up in that part of the world, High Low, we just launched a few months ago, which is sort of a uh, more moderate alcohol moderate body yep. lower calorie version of high lie which was um not an easy feat but to get all of that tropical fruit quality into a more you know, lower alcohol yeah, uh, lower calorie beer yeah, yeah yeah um awesome awesome <laughs> and then that margarita goza actually I, I i love the story behind that beer uh for our fifth anniversary back in 2014 we kind of divided the brewery up into different departments and had each department design their own beer for our anniversary oh, fun. Um, yeah <laughs> which is awesome. And the packaging yeah. guys, they work in our packaging hall, which is not air conditioning or not air conditioned. And it's friggin' hot. Yep. You know, even today, early May, it was over 90 degrees today. Ooh. So those guys Warm. wanted to design something that was going to be kind of light, crushable, easy drinking at the end of their super hot shift. Yeah. So they came up with this recipe for Margarita Goza. That's um, awesome. <laughs> 4.2% light tart tastes, and it is as advertised. It tastes like a damn margarita. It does. Yeah. Um, yeah so, and, and that's a beer that we originally had developed and released for the fifth anniversary, and it just took off in a way that we weren't expecting, and we kind of brew a, brewed a, another batch, and it was a little bit bigger, and then we brewed it and put it in cans, and then we, so it, it just really grew organically. Um, I love that beer. It's a great warm weather beer. Definitely. Um, yeah. It's just a great sure. all-around style. I mean, it just blends itself so well. It goes out a margarita. Like, that's just... Perfect summer beer. Yeah, I love it. Yeah. Yep. It's it's intuitive, yeah, for yep. sure. And then, yeah, Wayne, if you want to touch on some of the cooler stuff we've been doing uh, down here in Tampa recently. So, um, not sure if it's been released yet, but we uh, we recently brewed a beer called uh, Elotes Paletas. Um, and it's, uh, if you've ever been to a Latin market, they have the, sometimes you'll find this candy. And the candy on, it, it's like uh, it's like a lollipop or something. And the candy that's on the end of the lollipop is shaped, it's in the shape of like an ear of corn mm. and it's covered in chili powder. Ooh. So <laughs> basically this is a goza that was inspired by that candy. So it's a 4% goza that has malted corn in it and it has a uh, lime, ancho and wahio chili peppers, a um, little bit of salt, a little bit of coriander. So we're Sounds trying awesome. to get trying to get that similar expression out of the lollipop, um, but inside of a Goza. Yeah. So it's, it's like the most perfect summer brunch beer <laughs> you, you can have because yes. it has some of the earthiness, some of the fruitiness and some, a slight smokiness from the chili peppers, but it also has the acidity of the lime um, and a little bit of salinity from the salt of a Goza. Yeah. Um, and it's, it only 4%, so it's just, oh, this is too good. Love you know, I like, can't stop drinking this. It's <laughs> at the electrolyte, you know, you get that right. in there. Um, really, I, I can't wait to have that beer once I get back to Tampa again in a couple of weeks. Now, will um, that be canned, or is that just uh, taproom ex- exclusive? It's taproom only, but I'm hoping it gets responded to well, because I'd like be to cool. make more of it. Yeah, yeah. Um, we'd love to see that up here. We also did... Uh, we did a, a pretty big double IPA that uh, that I'm proud of, and it's it was it's uh, Kavik uh, nice. yeast base. Yep. And this particular strain produces um, pineapple, uh, mango, and um, and pink guava. Nice. And it, it's got a pretty busy hop bill, so eight and a half percent, but super tropical. Um, and God, I think it has about six to eight different hop varieties in it. Oh, nice. But, uh, <laughs> yeah, but it doesn't That's drink cool. like it's it's an eight and a half. Yeah. Um, it, I'm being told it's drinking more like a six. Dangerous. But, uh, it's dangerous, yeah. Love it. And yeah. one of the ones that I'm I'm most proud of recently that's probably the most unique, um, it was a beer that I brewed in collaboration with Eric Johnson from Wild Heaven, who Neil mentioned earlier. 
uh, and the name of the beer is Tama Shanter, which is a Scottish hat. It sort of looks like the uh, like the top of a mushroom, right? Okay. And um, the beer is a 6.4% Scotch ale, strong Scotch ale, nice. but it's on the low end of the ABV equation. And it has, um, it has candy cap mushrooms in it from the Pacific Northwest. And these uh, specific mushrooms have like this concentrated maple syrup like character oh my God. Um, yes. with, with slight hints of curry. So it, we so ended cool. up integrating mm-hmm. these so well into the Scotch ale. And um, I mean, I'm sure you're probably fairly <sighs> familiar so with how well maple could go with a scotch ale. Yeah. But maple and from it, like a mushroom, that's like that's unheard of. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Mind blowing. It's, that's really cool. It's one, of the, it's one of the few mushrooms that are actually used to make desserts. And mm. it, it can't be grown commercially, it can only be foraged, which oh. makes it harder to get your hands on. Yeah. Um, sure. but we were able to get enough to make a 10 barrel batch and I would I'm super happy with that beer. That's Out of everything cool. I do this year, even if it was only a 10 barrel batch, that's probably going to be the beer I'm going to end up saying I'm the most pleased with this entire year. So, Wayne, I am curious. Mushroom beer. Um, I, I I don't know of many brewers who would go out in the world and just say like, oh, yeah, I want to brew a mushroom beer. Where did you get that inspiration? Is that food driven, culinary driven, or is that just like your research? Culinary. If you look if you look at a lot of our beers, um, probably... If, Probably if you take like a closer look at our barrel aged beers, it might give you an even better idea. But back in in the early 90s, when I started off as a home brewer, a lot of my beers were more culinarily inspired, but I wasn't allowed to brew them um, by any brewery until I got to Cigar City Brewing. Or I was told there were stupid ideas and no one would buy it. So by the time I got to Cigar City, Joey said he, he rarely said no. That's and awesome. um, so it, I was able to actually start doing things that I wanted to do in the early 90s by 2009. But it took yeah. that long to get there. Wow. I'd imagine, I guess, some of those ideas probably were pretty um, wild. Like, wild for yeah. that time period. So um, I guess I can understand that. But I'm glad you're able to finally find Cigar City because yeah. that's I, yeah. I love the idea of, a, of this crazy, funky mushroom beer and stuff. Yeah. I think that's pretty cool. So I just want to make it clear to our listeners, these beers are exclusive to the, the tap room, correct, Neil? That's that's right. Um, we have a tap room that's in our original brew house. So it's actually um, the, the tap room surrounds the original brew house that Wayne brewed the very, very first batches of Cigar City cool. beer on, which is pretty cool. neat. Um, but yeah, we're right by the airport in Tampa. We're right by Raymond James Stadium where the Bucks play. Um, I think you guys know we got a couple players from uh, <laughs> your football team up there. Whatever. You got a Super Bowl from our team, but that's yeah. Cool. yeah, whatever. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's <laughs> hey, we 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 were due. We were due. Brady was just the vessel that kind of carried that to us. Exactly. Catalyst, you're right. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> exactly. But but all that to say, um, that that tap room is such an awesome place for us to really showcase some of the more ambitious stuff, some of the stuff that might not be ready for wide release. Mm. Um, but we've got you know, 10 to 15 beers that are only released in the tap room on draft at any given point. Um, super rare beers, barrel age stuff. So if anybody who's listening does find themselves down in Tampa, um, come by the brewery on Spruce street. It's, uh, we, we got some beers for you. Plus you're in a great location. So it sounds like a no brainer. Like yeah. why not? And the weather's nice. Yeah, definitely. Um, absolutely. Absolutely. Well, it's, it's actually kind of an interesting to kind of go back to some of the original stuff with cigar city. Um, the fact that, so many people do travel back and forth to Florida from the Northeast, from the Midwest, um, I think really helped fuel the name, getting the name out there. Yeah. You know, if we were in Sheboygan, Wisconsin, I don't think Cigar City <laughs> would be sort of where we are. Because the number of people, even when we were a very, very small brewery and we were barely in the Tampa market, the number of people from New York and Massachusetts and New England or uh, Michigan and Ohio who come down to Florida for vacation – it basically, when people are coming to, to Florida, it's almost always under good pretense. You know, True. like you said earlier, they're yeah. going to Disney World or they're um, going on spring break or they're coming down for spring training or, um, you know, they're going down to visit grandma and grandpa. And they would come down, <laughs> try the, whoa, I want to try the local beer. And they'd try Highlight and they'd go back to those places they and say, talk this about incredible it. beer, yeah. you know, I'd, and oh, I, I can only get it in Tampa. And then as we grew and as we started distributing to the Northeast and other other parts of the country um 
people were able to go to the supermarket or go to their craft beer store, grab a six pack of highlight and sort of those memories of all those great times in Florida would come kind of rushing back, which is, Love yeah, it. again, it's, it's a, an element of the brewery that, um, most other breweries don't have. Again, a brewery in Wisconsin doesn't necessarily have that ability. True. Yeah. Do you guys uh, get many athletes in the door? Or maybe Tom Brady. Has has the Brady family, yeah. Was, <laughs> was uh, Giselle in there? Yeah. Um, I haven't seen the Brady's recently, but um, we found Gronk outside of our dumpster the other day. <laughs> oh! Yeah, yeah, he was... Uh, he was a mess, but it's, yeah. it's like a weekly occasion. You, you, you find yeah. him passed out somewhere. Classic Gronk, classic Gronk. We've partied with Gronk, we know, we know. <laughs> Uh, I am curious, Wayne, in retrospect, 1993, let's go back in the time machine. Did you think that the beer that you'd be producing would be widely available through all 50 states? Uh, it, it, right. Highlight. I mean, uh, Cigar City's available countrywide, right? Correct. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. yeah. Um, you know, definitely not. I mean, even if I'd, even if we had gone into my first or second commercial job, I, I still would have told you no i mean even if we went into 2008 and talked about it or 2009 when we first opened i yeah. still would have laughed i would have laughed in your face yeah i never expect things to get here but um it's definitely um allowed me to learn a more, much more than i thought i ever would um i mean we've seen so many different uh different things by uh having you know like being in such a, a wide market um, mm -hmm. But it's also connected us with a lot of different people. Yeah, we've also made some great friendships and relationships as a result of it. Yeah, and yeah. Um, that's that's been you know more than awesome. I mean, some of the collaborations I've done, you know, nationally, internationally. Um, if I hadn't had those opportunities, you know, I would be less informed, cool. less experienced. Definitely, definitely, Neil. You're talking off air about this great collaboration that you're part of. Can you talk more about that? So it's, I think collaboration is actually a really great word for it. Um, we are part of a brewery co-op that's called Canarchy. So it's us, it's Oscar Blues, it's Deep Ellum, who are in Dallas, Texas, Three Weavers in LA, Squatters in Wasatch, who are in Utah, and Perrin up in Michigan. So we all operate as independent brewers, um, but we've come together as essentially a co-op um, really to kind of not only learn from each other as brewers, but to sort of navigate craft beer as a larger organization. So even though, you know, when Wayne's developing a recipe, he's not necessarily doing it, you know, in collaboration with with Oscar Blues or something like that. But when we're buying raw materials, we do it as one large organization. When, yeah. You know, and, and that's sort of the fun stuff, even the stuff that isn't as fun and sexy like health insurance. When we're buying but health still, insurance. But still, the fact that you can we, offer it, right? Because exactly. you're in this and, whole group. Exactly. Yeah. And, and we do it as a, an organization that has 500 employees rather than 12 50. Uh, uh, <laughs> yeah 50 yeah, <laughs> yeah. exactly um and the other thing that that's really allowed us to do is grow we wouldn't be like we we're talking about earlier we wouldn't be in 50 states and you know almost 20 international markets if we were just brewing here in tampa um the demand for highlight especially is really outstriped anything that, that we're able to produce here in Tampa. So being part of this organization, we're able to move capacity around. So we brew an awful lot in North Carolina. We brew highlight in North Carolina, Texas, Colorado, California, and Michigan right now, which wow. is, that's really a lot of Wayne's nine to five these days is kind of keeping track <laughs> of highlight production in all those areas. Yeah. But not only does that allow us to keep up with demand, that allows us to get the freshest beer possible into those markets. So, mm. you know, if you're in not sitting Cal around for weeks and weeks on a truck. Exactly. Yeah. yeah. It's, so the beer that you're drinking in, you know, Southern California is brewed in Southern California. So we're able to get it on the supermarket shelf at just a couple of days old rather than yeah, exactly like you said, kind of it sits in a truck and um, the logistics and the cost of all that. So it's th this being a part of Canarchy has really been pretty uh uh, transformative for us as a company and it's allowed you to be big but still be small too like you're still a craft brewery you're not you're still able to brew mushroom beer yeah, yeah. exactly <laughs> mm -hmm. yes yeah. exactly long live mushroom beer yes <laughs> uh so i i am curious uh what is in the beer fridge at, at home for wayne and neil like what are you what are you drinking at home and uh, is any of the beer that you're drinking outside of cigar city inspiring you to brew other beers neil you want to go first Sure. Yeah. Um, I work a lot and, um, <laughs> yeah, same. I get it. <laughs> yeah. And especially as things kind of slowly change with COVID and I'm back in the brewery more often than I was a year ago. 
Um, I don't keep a ton of beer in, in the fridge. The one beer, um, you know, it might not be the most popular answer in the world, but the one beer that's always in my fridge is Coors Banquet. Um, <laughs> There's nothing wrong with that, buddy. There's I don't, nothing I don't wrong care what anybody that. says. Yep, that, yep. that beer is delicious. Um, yep. But I've also, right now in the fridge, got a couple beers from some local breweries. There's a, a relatively new brewery in Tampa called Magnanimous that's doing some really incredible cool. stuff. So I've got an IPA from them in the fridge. I've got a Vienna lager. Um, actually, when last time Wayne was in town, we were drinking some of this Vienna lager from uh, a brewery called Motorworks that's down in uh, Bradenton in, in the area. That's good. So cool. it's, yeah. yeah, it's tasty. But um, I don't keep a ton of beer in the fridge, to be honest. You know, when I when I want to drink a beer, I'm usually at work or right. I'm you know, out visiting accounts and that sort of thing. So when I'm home, I try to, you know, drink be water, kind to, yeah. be, be kind to the liver a little bit. Yeah. <laughs> Wayne, yeah. what about you? It's not uncommon for me to uh, to have like spot and lager and Sierra Nevada pale ale. Um, yeah, awesome. you're, you're just drinking drinking beers, you know. Definitely. Um, and I usually have drinks uh, on like Friday or Saturday. Um, so uh, a, l- a lot of my exploration doesn't take place at home. It takes place when I'm when I'm away from home. Yeah. So, yeah. Home is more about relaxing yeah. and being away from home and drinking beer is more about, you know, thinking and working and being inspired. Definitely. I want a job that's thinking about drinking beer. <laughs> right. <laughs> I'm jealous. So Florida, we mentioned earlier, it's like five states in one state, right? Like there's different regions. We have a, a, a different ethos, different nationalities, everything. It's a, it's a melting pot, right? How does a state like Florida, you know, you have Cigar City. I would argue that you probably are the biggest brewery in Florida. And probably Florida, if it's similar to, you know, your towny Massachusetts or your Midwest states, heavily rely on drinking domestic beers, right? How does a, a Cigar City exist in Florida where, you know, a Budweiser, a Coors Banquet, a Miller High Life uh, reigns supreme? It's, I think, the fact that we from day one, you know, to kind of wrap up a lot of what Wayne was, was touching on from the early days, the brewery always existed to offer something different and offer something that was going to be ambitious. And again, really informed by, uh, by the area. And that's something that Budweiser and Coors simply can offer. Um, but actually to kind of touch on the, the two things that you, that you had mentioned in that question, we are the second largest craft brewery in the state of Florida. You know who the largest craft, you know, who largest, the, the largest craft Yingling? brewery in the state of Florida? Probably Yingling. Yingling. Yeah, yeah, yeah. They, wow. they make more beer and sell more beer in Florida than they do in Pennsylvania. Pennsylvania yeah. That's crazy. Which is pre- it's pretty wild yeah. to think. Yeah. yeah. Um, but all, all that to say, we're doing something, and, and this actually illustrates your point pretty well. We do something very different than Yingling. Of um, course, we, yeah. I, we have nothing but respect for them. They've actually been mm-hmm. great partners as you know, and they're still independently owned. They're still a craft Definitely. brewery. Mm-hmm. They've been great folks to us, especially in the early days. Um, but what they do is very traditional and very sort of, um, you know, w- within a very specific scope. Yeah. We can say cookie cutter. You can't. <laughs> yeah, no, 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 not at all. Yeah, I, I, hey, I, I love a Yingling. Me too. Yeah, but, yeah, yeah. Definitely. Definitely. But the, re- the reality is what the, the stuff that even just the stuff that Wayne was talking about earlier is just so it's such a wide breadth and incorporates so many different influences. And um, so much of our local area, again, is expressed through our beer. And that's something that you don't get cracking open a, a Coors Banquet necessarily. Definitely. Yeah. Yeah. No, for sure. Yeah. My, my favorite question is, what do you both want to learn more about in the brewing industry? Probably there's t- technical things. Um, there's uh, barrel aging related things. Um, I can't, I mean, right now, actually, I, I can discuss this. We've been working more on stability. So stability has been a big focal point. Um, so with with stability testing, um, we're basically taking beers, different brands, putting it into three uh, temperature zones, and and then conducting sensory um, at uh, at different time increments. And we take that sensory data, feed it back into um, into like a, like a, you know we we bank it basically, and then we can come back and we can review all the data and sort of see how. A century felt about um, about those beers at those different timelines at those specific temperature ranges, and um, and that's been pretty interesting. That's what I've been working on lately. Hopefully, we'll have something um, by the end of the year. But it, it takes a long time to do it, you know, because we're not 
we're not trying to accelerate temperature aging. We're trying to do it all, you know, like by maintaining that temperature. Yeah. Obviously, obviously, if I took the beer and I put it into the boiler room at like 110 <laughs> degrees, I could rapidly accelerate it. Yeah. But definitely. does it actually replicate the same thing as aging it at X temperature? You know? Right. So, if it sits in the back of a fridge. Or a car or, or whatever. A car, yeah. yeah. Exactly, yeah. yeah. So stability testing and learning how to make beer more stable yeah. has been a big focus lately. Definitely. I wish that was right. more of the focus with a lot of breweries, truth be told. Yeah, same. Yeah. Well, Tierra Nevada, they were the masters of it. Absolutely. Yeah. yeah. They've done agree. such a great job with it. Yeah. Yeah. I, I, I think my answer to that question is everything. That That's part <laughs> of what I really, really, really love about working in this industry and specifically working at Cigar City. You know, and in the morning, I might be talking with Wayne and his production team about, you know, hop terpenoids and, um, you know, essential mm-hmm. oils and hops. And then 10 minutes later, I'm talking with our social media specialist about social media impressions. And then, you know, <laughs> yeah. an hour later, I'm on the phone with somebody in finance, you know, about um, <laughs> billing. And then I'm talking with our logistics guys about trucking routes and, you know, how yep. logistics yep. works and um, LTL shipping and, and that sort of thing. And then the next minute, I'm talking with, the tap room about, you know, draft system maintenance. Um, that's, that's what I, that's what gets me excited to come into work every day, knowing that I'm not just going to be focused on this one specific thing that I'm going to be learning so much from every single person in this brewery about how breweries run. It really touches so many different elements. You know, it touches organic chemistry. It touches business finance, um, distribution. It touches legal issues, especially because, you know, with this alcohol, it's a controlled substance. Yeah. So sure. learning about different liquor laws, you know, I can tell you about liquor laws in freaking the state of Oklahoma. I, 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 I don't, I, I didn't anticipate Ever learning about that. that. Yeah, yeah. Right, exactly. Which is, which is pretty cool. It keeps it yeah. exciting. Yeah. Is there anything in the, the, the beer industry that frustrates either of you? There's a lot of things, but I can't say it. <laughs> I can't say it. No, we'll talk I can't say it on record. Lactose IPAs. I don't know. <laughs> Neil, um, yeah, there's there, there's always room for improvement. Um, I, it's been encouraging in the last couple of years to see sort of the um, homogenous sort of um, demographics of craft beer consumers and cra- and craft beer employees change a lot. Yeah. Um, and especially in the last year with a lot of efforts, like, um, th- th- there've been a lot of initiatives that breweries and, and sort of craft beverage, uh, figures have put together, like, um, the Michael Jackson scholarship that, uh, Garrett Oliver up in Brooklyn at Brooklyn yeah. brewery put together to help, um, really encourage people of color and, um, underrepresented people to get into beer and get into, um, spirits and, and, um, definitely. Yeah. yeah I'd, say, I'd say that's one thing I would like to see sort of continue to uh, improve, just getting more representation, getting more people involved in what we're doing as an industry. Great answer. Yeah. Cool. Well, more important, not more importantly, I guess important, I want to get people to Cigar City. Yeah. I mean. You got some really cool beers only on draft. So we got to find out where you are. Because people are getting vaccinated. People are traveling. We're going vacation. And I can't believe I'm saying this. I kind of want to go to Florida. Right. I got to see my friend Eric. <laughs> <laughs> so where can we find you uh, physically? Sure. So our, our main hub, sort of the mothership, is uh, on Spruce Street in Tampa. Again, we're right over by the airport, right over. We're just off the of Dale Mabry Highway, which is kind of the big north-south uh, street here in Tampa. Um, we also have a few other sort of satellite locations. We have a downtown tap room that's right across the street from Amelie Arena, where the lightning play. Um, so oh, cool. you know, come down here. It's actually, this was moving to the area. I wasn't expecting this to be such a hockey city, <laughs> yeah, but this is a, it's amazing how much they, they've gotten behind uh, the Tampa Bay lightning. So we've partnered cool. with them um, and we opened up a tap room right across, uh, right across the street, essentially from Amelie arena. We also have a tap room inside of Tampa international airport. So we're one of only two active breweries nice. inside of an airport in the world. We're in Terminal C at Tampa International. So if you go through Terminal C, that's mostly kind of uh, Southwest flights. Um, we're actually brewing beer inside of On the tap site. room. Wow. It's, oh, that's it's awesome. Not, it's not just a, you know, Cigar City <laughs> branded bar. Yeah. We're actually brewing beer inside of the airport, um, Very which cool. is pretty, pretty, cool. pretty damn cool. Yeah. But the, the, the mothership again is uh, we're on Spruce Street, the Spruce Street tap room. Yeah. We've got full, ser- uh, full service kitchen. Nice. 
usually you know, upwards of 30 different beers on draft, many of which you can't get anywhere else. Yeah. Very I'll cool. make sure when I'm in Tampa, I will text Tom and, and, and Rob and the Gronkowskis and the Brady. Yeah, yeah. We'll, we'll, we'll make there. sure they come through yeah. with us because, you know, <laughs> they're shy. Yes, you can understand. Yeah, to, to, when you talk with Tom, tell me he owes, owes me money. He does. I, I he oh, mentioned that, oh, Neil. It's crazy. I mean, he's like, he's like, I don't want to be a scumbag, but <laughs> things are running a little lean at the Brady house, I've heard. <laughs> you know, oh, yeah, so they're, retired. They're hurting so for money, I'm they sure. are hurting, yeah, Neil. You have to understand that times are tough. Uh yeah, I'm super pumped. It's awesome to talk with you. Uh it's 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 surreal for us. It's like, you know, I've I've been crushing this beer honestly for the last summer and and on and before. I mean, I remember having my first highlight ale and being like yeah, this really is actually really awesome. And yeah. we are very fortunate in Massachusetts to have amazing local breweries and have great beer. You know, within a 50 mile radius of me, I can go to five different breweries. But to have a beer from Florida where it's readily available, readily available, really good. Um, yeah. it's really consistent is awesome and mm. uh, widely available across the country and in and, and a couple places across the globe is is awesome and Wayne that must be so humbling for you that's awesome and I'm, I'm so psyched you know illegally home in 1993 to doing this this is like a so if cool. this isn't a success story in right. a year I don't know what <laughs> is like we need a we yeah. need a Disney movie for this <laughs> it was it was nice to move to, to Tallahassee yeah. to a state where it's actually legal to home right brew. yeah right because even when I moved there and I was brewing I was actually still home brewing at, at home um, in Tallahassee. Yeah. So it was crazy. You know, like I never had time off. I brewed commercially five days a week. Then I brewed on Saturday and Sunday. Oh, Good for nice. You. Yeah. Well, it's clearly showing it's in the off. beers that you're, you're producing. Yeah. And uh, honestly, they're very consistent beers. I've never had an issue with any of the beers that I've ever gotten from, mm -hmm. from you guys. Oh. So that's a huge attribute for you guys. Yeah. And uh, as we like to end every episode with, what are you most proud of? Oh, I open mean, open ended, open ended. Yeah. <laughs> I, I mean, I guess if we're talking about uh, beer in the brewery, I think that uh, you know, with with the team that I've had at Cigar City Brewing, this is probably the most successful thing I've done in my lifetime. Um, if you if you stand back and look at it, I mean. Um, it, it's incredible to, to span, you know, 12 years, um, mm -hmm. and, and have covered as much ground as we have and, and still have, you know, like, uh, have a core brand that continues to remain pertinent and grow. Definitely. Um, so, you know, the brewery and, and what we've done over the past 12 years is, is probably what I'm the most proud of as Definitely. far as career is concerned. Yeah, Definitely. Yeah, I'd, I'd say just to be a part of the team that has has helped create a brand that is known literally throughout the world. Um, yeah. Again, I've been su super fortunate to be able to travel, and you know, I went to St. Petersburg, Russia, and they go, "Oh, yes, you go city, uh, JLA. We have this beer, very good, very good." Um, like that—that that is really, really damn cool to be able to travel the world and um, have been part of the team with Wayne, with the brewers, with everybody here yeah. that has made something that people, uh, across the world are familiar with. It's pretty, pretty damn cool. That yeah. is cool. I think there's a huge, uh, I mean, the proof, proof is in the pudding, Wayne, you've been at Cigar City, what, 13 years, 12 years. Yeah. Uh, yeah. You 13. have, you have not jumped shift to make your own brewery. You still stay home at Cigar City and want to make it as successful as possible. And that shows to the ethos of what cigar city stands for and that's really really cool to me i mean we took so much i took so much time helping to build it it just be um it feels like your own almost it, too yeah so it's i mean it's hard to walk away from something like that you invested so much time yeah. and so much of yourself in because it's not just about the time it's also about the creativity and you know like everything right. else that went into it yeah well <laughs> Neil and Wayne, if you're ever in the Massachusetts area, please don't hesitate Here's to reach out and hang out with us. We would love to party with you guys. And we hope to make it down to uh, to Tampa pretty soon. I know Tom Brady texts me every week and he's like, come hang out with me, man. I mean, what are Tom you doing? Day, yeah, man. but uh, it's really awesome. I, I love the beer that you guys are producing and uh, I can't wait. I hope, I fingers crossed that that chili beer comes up in, in cans in the next year. Until then. Cheers. Cheers. 
right, everyone, this is Ryan's absolute least favorite part of the podcast. And it's kind of like your beer being empty and the bar's closed. Right. You can't get another one. You got to go home. You got to go home. Oh, gosh. It's the outro. The outro. So, Ryan, who do we have next week? It's going to be a surprise. <gasps> it is going to be a surprise. We told you last week. We're not telling you this week. You never know what to expect from us here. How about this? We promise we will tell our listeners every week the episode coming up if we get 25 people to subscribe to our Patreon in the next 48 hours. What? Done. All right. Easy peasy. So you guys, if you want to, you know, find out what episodes are coming up. You got to give us, you know, a little little support in the Patreon. Because we can continue to get episodes like Cigar City, The Alchemist, Notch. Who else, Erica? Oh, we got, you know, Drucker, we got... Night Shift. Night Shift. We got so many. We so got many. so many of them. So, yeah. Follow us, support us, and uh, we'll see you next week. Cheers. Cheers.